part, nobody else speak. This is my part, nobody else speak. This little Peter Parker, House of M. More specifically, how Peter Parker's story ended in House of M. Let me break it down. So House of M was a storyline where the Scarlet Witch restructured the entire Marvel Universe so that everybody got their deepest desire. Captain America never died in World War II, he simply aged and lived his life. Magneto got a world ruled by mutants. And Spider-Man got a life of happiness. Also, if you don't know, in the comics, Peter Parker's life fucking sucks. Anyone he gets close to is almost sure to die or get their life fucked in some way. Pete just wanted to live a happy life. In House of M, he got Gwen Stacy back. He was married. He had a child. Uncle Ben is alive. Captain Stacy is alive. Everybody knows his identity and it's not a problem. But then Wolverine finds him. And he makes him remember the real world. He has to help bring this universe to an end. And with it lose every good thing this life has ever given him. And he does. But he still remembers all of it. Do I remember that time Spider-Man fucked Mary Jane to death? No? Great. Awesome. I'll tell you about it. This story comes from the lovely Spider-Man Rain. Never, ever, ever read Spider-Man Rain. If I had to synopsize it, it's a lot like a bad Dark Knight Returns, but even darker. So Peter's an old man, living alone. And at this point in the comics, that doesn't make any sense, because in our timeline, he's married to Mary Jane. Somehow J. Jonah Jameson's still alive when Peter's like 60. Dude already had white hair when Peter was like 16. How does that make any fucking sense? Whatever. All of the Sinister Six are still technically alive. Dude, everyone being alive is so confusing because that's how old Peter Parker is. So some shenanigans happen. A fun shenanigans. Sad shenanigans. Remember, we're trying to be dark and edgy. Somehow, Peter ends up at Mary Jane's grave. I'm not gonna check why, because honestly, I, I don't want to. So he digs up Mary Jane, because of course he does, and he starts monologuing. Apparently, Mary Jane died of cancer, caused by radioactivity. Apparently, it's not just Peter's blood that's radioactive. Yeah, it's exactly what you're thinking. I love reading Spider-Man. He's just so hopeful and upbeat. It's great. Yay, Spider-Man. So recently, I've seen a few other comic book creators hop on the MCU Spider-Man isn't really Spider-Man train. Which, if you've been here a while, I said that a, a little while ago. As a recap, I said that MCU Spider-Man is basically just whitewash Miles Morales. But anyway, hopping off of that point, let me tell you one of the big reasons that I'm disappointed by how the MCU handled Spider-Man's side characters. Specifically, this one. For those of you who don't know, this is the MCU's version of Flash Thompson. And no, it's not because of the casting, I think this dude would be a great comic book Flash Thompson. No, like with Peter, it's how the MCU has decided to write Flash Thompson. Flash Thompson has such an intriguing, nuanced, and interesting character in the books that this version simply won't be able to pull off as effectively. And yes, I've heard this a thousand times, it's a different interpretation. They don't need to stick to how the comics made them. I'm not saying they have to. I'm saying there's already an interesting story regarding this character that simply won't be able to be used anymore. Or at the very least, not used as effectively. For context, this guy eventually becomes this guy. I'll say how in part two. This is part two. If you're not supposed to be here, go back and watch part one. What the fuck are you doing here? So why don't I like MCU's Flash Thompson? And so that, I'm gonna have to tell you why comic book Flash Thompson is just so interesting. Flash Thompson originally was Peter Parker's high school bully. While at first the relationship was really confrontational with Flash being a complete asshole to Peter, eventually they became pretty good friends. Flash Thompson was always a huge Spider-Man fan. While he didn't know that Peter and Spider-Man were the same person, he always looked up to Spider-Man. He thought he was a hero. He wanted to be just like him. Flash didn't have powers. He wasn't especially smart. But one one thing he was good at was being a quarterback, being a leader, being physical. So after high school, he joined the army. And while in the army, he was deployed to Iraq. And sadly, in a bout of heroism inspired by Spider-Man, he lost both of his legs. However, he was so good at his job that the military made him their first candidate for their new program, the Agent Venom program. You see, recently they had pacified the Venom symbiote, and they wanted to use it to make a super soldier. In steps Flash Thompson. The symbiote gave him his legs back and it let him be a soldier again. And I'll explain why we can't have this in part three. This is part three, you know the fucking drill. So why can't MCU Flash be Agent Venom? Essentially, it's because he's too smart. Flash Thompson in the books initially was a very, very simple character. He was a big dumb brute who could only do one thing good. And later books iterated on that to go, yeah, that's really who he was. But he could do that one thing really well and he put his passion into it so much that he got really, really good at it. It was a story about overcoming who you used to be. That no matter what you come from, no matter who you were, and no matter what happens to you, you can still be a hero. 
that is inspiring. But MCU Flash Thompson, he's unbelievably smart. He goes to a school for gifted people. And he's not a big dumb brute, he's just kind of a rich, pretentious dick. So yeah, you could still do the story. And yes, it will still have the same message, but the story won't have nearly as much impact. Because it is a lot easier to just not be an asshole than it is to come from nothing, have nothing, have very few connections, have no other options, and still choose to be a hero. So a while back before I got really big on here, I made a video stating that Andrew Garfield was my favorite Spider-Man of all time. His writing, his acting, his second costume, just mwah, oh, it was great. And honestly, at least with the first movie, I think that that extends to basically all of the characters. Don't get me wrong, the storyline's kind of meh. But so are a lot of comics. That Flash Thompson will forever be my favorite Flash Thompson. He embodied the character so fucking much. He only had like six scenes, but even in those, it was just so good. He was Peter's bully. They were mean to each other, but in a way that I could see them being friends later. After Peter got his powers, it turned more into like this competitive rivalry. And oh my God, the scene after Uncle Ben dies, when Flash just goes up to Peter to say he's sorry. And even after Peter lashes out, Flash still empathizes with him. Oh my god, it's my favorite scene in any Spider-Man movie. Look at this dorky fucking smile when someone compliments his Spider-Man shirt. Oh, so good. Reed Richards diagnosed himself as autistic and then promised to cure. Whew, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. Before we even get started, I would just like to say that I am very, 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 very neurotypical. If the spectrum of neurodivergence was a spice rack, I would be flower. So obviously, I cannot speak on how well neurodivergent people are portrayed in media. I will just be reporting to you what I have found. First time it was really mentioned in canon was in Grant Morrison's Fantastic 1234, where Sue Storm said this. And then there's the frame you're probably referring to from Fantastic Four Season 1, where Reed Richards responds to the question, how insane are you, with this. So, like I said before, flower brain. So obviously I can't speak to how good of a representation this is, but something both about how that question and how that answer was phrased just doesn't sit right with me. Like, I'm 100% behind this character direction. From what I read in articles, it seems like it's been fanon for a while already. Seems they just didn't really stick the reveal. But to answer your question, yeah. I am sick and tired of Deadpool being misrepresented in pop culture. Whenever anybody outside of comics talks about Deadpool, all I usually see is them either saying he's way too edgy, or he's just this lol, random, funny, meme -y sort of character. And that's just not the fucking case. If you can't tell, Deadpool is very near and dear to my heart. He's been my favorite character since I was 14 years old. And the thing is, is that he's a lot deeper of a character than most people give him credit for. But here's a few things about Deadpool that you might not know. Thing number one, Deadpool is actually a pansexual. And that doesn't just mean that he fuck anything he sees. No, that means that he can genuinely and completely fall in love with anybody, regardless of who they are. Thing number two, Deadpool has a daughter named Eleanor. That's right, Deadpool actually has a Latina daughter by the name of Eleanor that he keeps away from him because of his job and how risky his life is. But he's a very loving, caring father and is a huge part of her life. Number three, Deadpool is depressed, suicidally so. Most people know that Deadpool can break the fourth wall. He knows he's in a comic book. But the problem with that is that he also knows that none of his choices matter. No matter what he does, there is a status quo that his life and his decisions will always be set back to. No matter how big the change, no matter how big the arc, no matter how big the event, it'll always be reset. Nothing matters. So, understandably, that gives him pretty severe depression. Number four. Deadpool doesn't actually like killing people. He's admitted that he doesn't actually enjoy killing anybody, and the only reason he does it is because it's the only thing he thinks he knows how to do. Number five, uh, Deadpool's a loner on purpose. He believes that he is a cancer on other people. He believes that just being near him will most likely cause someone to get hurt, be it from him or otherwise. And that's why he tries to be so annoying so people don't get close. So I have like a thousand assignments that I should be doing right now instead, but yeah, no, I'm gonna do this. Put some fucking respect on Cyclops' name. Dude's not as much of a bitch as you think he is. The only other X-Man that the movies did dirtier than Cyclops was Storm. Cyclops is not supposed to be the goody two-shoes Captain America of the X-Men. Cyclops is the middle ground of the philosophy between Professor X and Magneto. Cyclops thinks that humans should live in harmony with mutants, but he's also not afraid to kick some fucking ass to do it. Cyclops formed the X-Force. For those of you who don't know, that's the Black Ops section of the X-Men that goes out and fucking mercs people. And his rivalry with Wolverine isn't as one-sided as it is in the movies. Cyclops' 
power can evaporate a sentinel in like five seconds. There's a reason that Logan respects him as a leader. There's a reason someone as bad as Emma Frost went for fucking Scott. I'm just saying, usually he's the butt of every single X-Men joke, so I don't know, think about that. Okay, you know, when I posted my original video about Cyclops, I, I was not even thinking about Darwin, frankly, because um, I forgot he was even in the fucking movie. So yeah, let's talk about Darwin. Darwin is a character who has a total of one, count them, one power. Survive. More specifically, his body will develop powers to keep him alive no matter what situation he's in. He went to try to fight the Hulk once and his body just decided to teleport him off planet somewhere because that was the safest option. Okay, so you have this character whose only power, whose only power at all is to survive no matter what the fuck you throw at him. And, and Fox decided that it would be a great idea to have him be the only character that died in the only movie he ever appeared in. It probably had nothing to do with the fact that he was also the only black character in that movie as well. Marvel, now that you have the rights, please don't fuck this up. We need to talk about Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Don't get me wrong, I love Tom Holland. He's an amazing actor, and from what I can tell, he's a great guy. But the way he's been written in his movies isn't particularly Spider-Man. Now just hold on a second. As Peter Parker and his mannerisms and everything that Tom Holland has created control over and how he acts as Peter, he is Peter Parker. Through and through. But in the stories he's written into, in the things he has written to do, that's, that's a different case. He's written closer to Miles Morales than Peter Parker. First big thing is that Spider-Man doesn't like the Iron Man all that much, like at all. Being friends with the Uber Capitalist doesn't exactly go for the whole friendly neighborhood Spider-Man thing though, does it? Point number two is for the period that Spider-Man is in his high school days, he's far too nice. Peter Parker's a fucking prick. He was the definition of a nice guy. He didn't just get bullied because he was smart, he got bullied because he was a self-isolating asshole. So, a lot of people commented on the first video that it's just a different interpretation, why do you care? Yeah, totally true. The movie versions of characters are never completely accurate to the comic versions of the characters. That's never gonna be the case. The problem stems from the fact that his character and stories are written so much closer to a pre-existing character that making him Peter doesn't make any sense. They took Miles Morales, they made him white, and they put him in the movies, and the problem is that they just thought that was cool. If you made an interpretation of Batman, where his parents were still killed, but then later in life he was injured to the point that the bat suit needed to be armored, and instead of fighting crime in Gotham, he just fought it all over the world, then why wouldn't you just make Iron Man? If people saying that he's not Miles and that he's just written as Peter, Ned is ganky. He has two living younger parental figures. Peter never actually cared about getting into the Avengers. The whole idolizing a pre-existing hero and then having to inherit their role in the universe once they pass. That's all Miles! But yeah, Tom is a great cast for Peter Parker, but they made the decision to write him as Miles. Does that mean the Black Panther and the Vision are, like... For those of you who didn't watch the original video, she's asking if because Vision is biological material fused with vibranium, and Black Panther is a human who becomes super after drinking a plant that is manipulated by vibranium, does that mean they're compositionally the same? Or at the very least, similar? My answer is... Maybe. Vision is mostly vibranium. Like, that seems to be the only thing that they put in the tube in the movies other than that artificial flesh thing they had at the beginning. While Black Panther is basically the exact opposite of that. He's flesh and blood with vibranium running through his veins. So it's a much, much, much lesser degree, but yeah, probably. It's hard to say because that's not Vision's origin in the comic. Vision's body in the comic was from the original Human Torch, who was an android. And he's infused with the brainwaves of somebody else. But for the movie specifically, yeah, I'd, I'd say probably yes. Two completely different degrees, but yeah, probably. It might just be my opinion, but I hope that helps. No, oh, shit, yeah, let's talk about it. So the original Human Torch was a character by the name of Jim Hammond. He was an android that, when exposed to oxygen, immediately burst into flames. He kind of started out as the sort of horror comics character, but as he learned to control his flames, he got a secret identity and became a superhero. He was actually the first character to appear on a comic with the title Marvel Comics. He was also one half of one of, if not the first, superhero crossover, when him in the Submariner had a big-ass fight. He also had a sidekick named Toro? Toro was a mutant with the ability to control fire. Basically, just 
the Human Torch's mini-me. He fought in World War II alongside Captain America. He's actually in the first Captain America movie. And in Marvel continuity, the Human Torch killed Adolf Hitler by burning him alive. <laughs> I love comics. Yeah, but sometime after the war, he was deactivated. And when Ultron was trying to make a body for himself, there's a perfectly good android body in the Mojave Desert, so he used the Human Torch's body and Wonder Man's brainwaves to make the vision. This is actually the funniest thing. It wasn't just Sam Jackson. The Ultimates Comics original artist actually based the visages of most of the characters off of pre-existing actors. In fact, in the story, the writer pokes fun at it with the first volume. The Avengers, otherwise known as the Ultimates in this universe, get together and they're joking about who would play them in a movie adaptation. Listen to this rundown. Obviously, Sam Jackson is Nick Fury. But then they would get Brad Pitt to play Captain America, Lucy Liu to play the Wasp, Johnny Depp to play Tony Stark, and Steve Buscemi to play Bruce Banner. Bruce takes such offense to that last comment that he almost goes off into a Hulk rampage because of it. God, I, I love comics. <laughs> so yeah, Sam didn't know about it at the time, but neither did any of the other actors. So I just saw something from X-Men Days of Future Past and it reminded me of something. How, how do I put this? That's not gonna get my nerd credentials revoked. He Hugh Jackman, Robert Downey Jr. Wolverine. And by that I mean he is a fine version of the character. He's a great interpretation of Wolverine. But he is a far, far cry from comic book Wolverine. In very much the same vein of Robert Downey Jr. being a far cry from comic book Iron Man. The closest analog that I can give to comic book Wolverine is like pre-PlayStation 4 Kratos. Dude is fucking... Feral. He's very much more antagonistic in the comics. He's also not supposed to be very kind on the eyes. Given comic book Wolverine now is very close to the Hugh Jackman that you see in the movies. But that is very much because how his movie form was adapted. Very much the same way as Iron Man. None of this is a bad thing. It's a great character. They're just very different in unique ways. I am not getting on this person. I just want to say that out front. Daredevil cannot see. Daredevil is very much blind. And it annoys me to no end that the movie and the shows have altered the perception of Daredevil in the fans' eyes to make people think he can see. There is no scene in Marvel Netflix that annoys me more than the world on fire scene in Daredevil Season 1. And yes, that includes the entirety of Iron Fist. For those of you who haven't seen the scene, he says that he can technically see, just it's closer to a world on fire than anything else. You can see like this, this is someone looking at him, but that's just not, not the case. I think this is like the movies and shows trying to adapt his radar sense. Daredevil in the comics kind of has like echolocation, which is usually visualized like this. The problem is, is I think that the filmmakers took that as literal. That's not actually what he sees. That's his brain interpreting what his radar sense picks up and the comic visualizing it for us. So yeah, no hate, but Daredevil is completely blind. So, I make this joke a pretty fair amount in my videos, but a lot of people don't seem to know the connection between Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Daredevil. So let's run it down. This is the original origin of Daredevil in the comic. There is a blind man walking into the street, Matt Murdock as a young child jumps into the street to save him, he knocks the old man out of the way, but a cylinder falls from the truck that is apparently radioactive and strikes him in the face. Now this is the origin of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and their original issue. You see there's a blind man walking into a street, into an oncoming car, a young man jumps into the road, gets hit with a cylinder that is possibly radioactive. That radioactive cylinder then rolls away, hits this child who's holding his pet turtles, and both of them fall into the sewer where the turtles are covered in that radioactive substance. The radioactive goo and the turtles, not, not the kid, the kid's fine. This means while they are not from the same publishing company, their origins are intrinsically linked. Neither has ever directly said that they are connected, but that's the same fucking event. God, I love comics. I'm gonna be talking about the last episode of WandaVision in this post, so if you haven't seen that episode, I don't know, just like... Fuck off and come back later. On the whole, the episode was great. It was a fun, fun episode. I just got a, a couple, a couple things. So, so first thing, so Pietro is just some fucking dude. For us, it makes sense that we were confused because we know that's Pietro from a different universe. But you're telling me that in the world, all that had to happen is that someone needed to have super speed, which mind you, superpowers are a fucking dime a dozen in this universe, 
They just needed to have that, have blonde hair, and say, yep, I'm Pietro, and she would just fucking roll with it? I get that she was confused, but d d what? Like, for her, that's not Fox's Quicksilver. That's just some guy who says he's Pietro and can run fast. If he was actually from a different universe, then that would make more sense, but w that's just some dude! Also, where's our Luke Skywalker-level cameo? Was it Nameless Scroll number three? Or perhaps it was Wanda's headdress? I don't know, I like the episode, just those things confuse me. Okay, so, yes and no. So here's the thing, the Weapon Plus program, which is where Weapon X came from, was all an attempt to recreate Captain America. Captain America was Weapon 1, Wolverine was Weapon 10, and that was so successful it created an offshoot of the Weapon Plus program called the Weapon X program. The Weapon X program had an offshoot of that where they were trying to create superpowers called Department K. Department K is where Deadpool was created. He wasn't a clone, he was just a guy who showed up and they tried to give him superpowers. It's not like the movie where he had a latent mutation, he was- he's a mutate, he was given mutation. And because he was given mutation and not born with mutation, every part of his body had that mutation, including his cancer. That's why he doesn't just have skin cancer, he's got super cancer. And the superpower he was given was based off of Wolverine's healing factor. So while, yes, he was an attempt to recreate Wolverine in a sense, he's not from the same department as X-23. Or even from the same program, for that matter. X-23 was an attempt to control C, control V, Wolverine. Deadpool was literally just a science experiment. Okay, so hold on, this actually allows me to talk about something. So the last video about Deadpool's only been up for like 10 minutes and already it's got a bunch of but what about comments on there. And this comment actually allows me to talk about something about Deadpool's origin. The fucking water is murky as shit. I personally go off of his first origin, but the problem with Deadpool is that he's been given about 30. Because the dude's insane, and for a long period of his history, he had amnesia and couldn't remember his own origin. Every time it is told in the comics, it's told differently. Sometimes he killed his parents. Sometimes his parents are alive. Sometimes he was a mutant. Most of the time he's a mutate. Sometimes he enrolled in Weapon X. Sometimes he went directly to Department K. Sometimes he's a military hero. And sometimes he's a giant fucking wuss that only got superpowers because he bitched out of joining the actual military. What I'm trying to say is that all basic origins for Deadpool are both canon and non-canon. Because whatever's canon at the moment will probably be written out of history in a couple of years. And that's honestly the same with every superhero, except Deadpool's is a lot more drastic than others. I mean, except for X-Men Origins Deadpool. If your backstory for Deadpool is X-Men Origins, you're, you're wrong. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. Okay, that's actually the funny thing, because we, we don't know his real name. <laughs> At least not for sure. Him and Joker are kind of even standing at that point. We think Joker's name is Jack Napier, but we're not sure. Don't you come into my comments with that three Jokers explanation. I don't, I don't regard it as canon. I don't like it, no. But yeah, we think his name is Wade Wilson, and that has been called into question. You see, there's a villain in the comics by the name of T-Ray. This is T-Ray, and he claims that he is Wade Wilson. Mind you, this is a point in the comics where Deadpool kind of had amnesia and didn't remember his past. He still doesn't technically remember his past. This story was never resolved, we don't know. But T-Ray claimed that his name was Wade Winston Wilson. And many a year ago, he was living his life with a woman named Mercedes. Into their life strolled a man by the name of Jack, and Jack said that he was going to steal T-Ray's identity as to hide from his employers, for former employers, and leave T-Ray's unrecognizable body for the employers to think it was him. Well, T-Ray survived, Mercedes didn't, and Jack was supposedly Deadpool. This is basically forgotten now, but we never learned if this was true or not. Alright, fine, but you get bedtime panda for this one. And if you hear snoring, I apologize. I have Doug. So, to understand this, you need to know a little bit about Multiple Man. Multiple Man has the power that he can create multiple duplicates of himself that will exist for as long as he sees fit, and once he's done with them, they become absorbed back into his body again. Basically, just clones he can merge with. And when he merges with them, he gets all of their memories and experiences. Okay, got it? Got it? Good. So Multiple Man and Siren work together at a place called X-Factor Investigations. Through a convoluted series of events that I don't really feel like getting into, the two of them end up sleeping together. And that, you know, produced what it usually does. So the two of them end up having a baby together. Here's where the scary shit kicks in. At the birth, Multiple Man being the father asks to hold the baby. As soon as the baby touches him, the baby starts to become absorbed just like any other clone of him. Multiple Man involuntarily absorbs his own child. Multiple Man thinks that maybe this is because he might have not slept with Siren, but maybe one of his duplicates did, and the genetic material of a clone is still a clone. But yeah, it's fucked up. Full Phoenix Wars Jean Grey versus Wanda the Scarlet Witch. Who's winning? I... I know people's memories of this are a little bit altered because of WandaVision, and WandaVision did it on a smaller scale, but did everyone just forget House of M? Over the course of that story, Wanda had two, count them, two mental breakdowns, and in both situations, horrendous shit happened. And not horrendous like, oh no, the Phoenix is gonna destroy the world. 
I mean, horrendous is an oh my fucking god, the Scarlet Witch has changed all of reality. Everything I knew and loved was a lie. Remember that time that she just invented two fucking kids? Which is, oh, I'm feeling a little bit of baby fever. <laughs> One was having a pretty rough go of it after the events of House of M. And as a common measured response to that, she wiped out 91% of the mutant population. She was just like, no more mutants, and then... <laughs> Gone. Congratulations, you're human now, or just fucking dead. Don't get me wrong, the Phoenix is a fucking threat. The Phoenix can destroy galaxies just because it fucking feels like it. But Tony Stark on a good day can kill the Phoenix. You can only kill Wanda if she wants to die. Which, which is a lot, she flip-flops like that. But hell no man, Wanda, all the way. No, no, yeah, that that's exactly who I'm talking about. It's just that she exists in Marvel now. Let's run this down. So the character of Angela was originally introduced in Spawn. This is Angela, by the way, says this. The issue that she was introduced in was co-written by Neil Gaiman. By the way, Neil Gaiman is the guy who wrote The Sandman and American Gods. He's hot shit, he's a big deal. Originally, the contract that Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane had was apparently work for hire, but later the two struck a deal. The contract stated that Gaiman would get the rights to the characters that he had created while working on Spawn, and McFarlane would get the rights to Miracle Man, but that contract fell through, which eventually led to Neil Gaiman suing Todd McFarlane, and that legal battle lasted about a fucking decade, eventually ending in Gaiman's favor. He was labeled as the copyrights co-owner of the comics that he worked on on Spawn, and he was granted full rights to the characters he created in the book, which Presumably out of spite, he immediately turned around and sold to Marvel. I love it, it's great. So, yeah, technically they're actually the same character. I am Groot, or would he actually go into what he's actually saying? So if you didn't watch the original video, the guy was asking if Groot learned ASL, would he say I am Groot, or would the sign language actually show what he's saying? It would actually show what he's saying, and I think that this question comes from a place of not knowing how the Groot language actually works. Not meant as an insult at all, it's, it's a deep comic thing. The Groot language is actually very complex, and if you know how to understand it, then you will actually get all of those complexities. Only problem is that auditorily, it just sounds like I am Groot in English, to a human ear. This is because Groots, being made of wood, have very stiff voice boxes, so the only things that they are able to pronounce is I am Groot. However, the different intonations and the way that they say I am Groot conveys what the meaning is. Mean anything, or it could just mean I am Groot. When translated, it's a very complex language, but you need to know how to translate it. Here's Jean Grey understanding all the subtext behind this one sentence. Also, we respect anybody who respects Jean Grey, she's a badass. Why Quill's Universal Translator wasn't able to pick this up, fuck if I know. So I usually make it a rule to not talk about the Marvel shows until they're done. I just, I don't want to get roped into all of the fucking discussions and theories that I just want to watch a show and enjoy it for being a show. But I just want to hop in because I noticed something. It's nothing important like the main theme of the show, which is the race, by the way, anybody who says it isn't not watching the fucking show. If you bullied Straw Hat Goofy for saying that ahead of time, then fuck you, get off my page. But I just wanted, I, I have a question to ask. Spoilers, by the way. So since Zemo was just sent back with the Wakandan Warriors, I'm assuming we're not going to see very much of him anymore. Which makes me question, what was the purpose of this mask? Like, I know it was a reference for nerds like me to be like, oh, he's wearing the mask, he's wearing the thing he wears in the comic. But if I'm remembering correctly, there's no reason in the show that he even has that motherfucker. He wears it a total of one time in a fight where everyone already knows who he is. And then takes it off and never wears it again. Does someone have an answer? I, I don't know. From what I remember, they don't even explain its significance in the show. They explain it in the comics, but not in the show. Let me know in the comments. They're actually considering putting out a six hour long endgame. No! No! This is exactly what I was worried about when the Snyder Cut came out! I don't want a six hour movie! No one wants a six hour movie! That is a quarter of a day spent watching a movie I already saw! The Snyder Cut was a very, very specific set of circumstances that made that okay. The man had his movie taken and then destroyed. He had the right to remake it. You guys already made your fucking movie! Just put fucking deleted scenes in the fucking menu or something! All I want are two things. I want a funeral scene for Black Widow and the kneeling scene. Everything else can go! If you if you want the six hour endgame, that, that's great. I'm glad for you. But that is excessive for the sake of being excessive! Hell, the Snyder Cut didn't even need to be four hours! What in the name of Jack Kirby still smoking ghost would you even put in a six hour endgame? What, are we gonna watch Thanos decompose in real time? No, thank you. I think it's funny how people very rarely think about how close Spider-Man is at any time to being the scariest motherfucker alive. Not for lack of trying on Marvel's part, they have very well illustrated the fact that Spider-Man will fuck you up. Case in point, one of Spider-Man's very many clones is named Kane. Kane 
is a serial killer. He's also infamous for leaving a specific mark. That mark is putting his hand on your face, turning on his wall sticking ability, and then ripping your fucking face off. When Doc Ock first took over Spider-Man's body in Superior Spider-Man, he accidentally punched off Scorpion's jaw because he didn't realize that Spider-Man constantly has to hold back his own strength. One of the coolest moments in Spider-Man history, which one more day just fucking erased, was that after Peter found out that Kingpin was responsible for Ant-Man getting shot, he rolled up and effortlessly kicked the shit out of him, just to prove that he could kill him at any time. Like, Peter Parker is just like one bad day away from just ending everyone. <laughs>